Right now, you can buy a pill online that claims to double your endurance without stepping foot in a gym. It even has peer-reviewed data behind it. But here's the catch. The way most people are taking it almost certainly doesn't work. And the way it does work, at least so far, isn't something you can order from a supplement site and pop before a workout. So in this episode, I'm gonna break down exactly what SLUPP332 or SLUP really does, how close we are to making it viable for humans, and why the current hype might be setting you up to fail or even worse. So let's start with the obvious question. Why does a molecule like SLUPP332 or SLUP even matter? You already know the answer. Exercise is still the most powerful medicine we have. It improves everything, cardiovascular health, glucose metabolism, cognition, mood, longevity, in ways that no single pill has ever come close to matching. But here's the uncomfortable reality. Not everyone can exercise enough to get those benefits. People with advanced heart failure, severe obesity, muscle wasting conditions, spinal injuries, for them, even walking across the room can feel like a marathon. And for the rest of us, between family, work, and modern life, it's not hard to see why a pill that mimics some of the key benefits of exercise is so tempting. So researchers have spent decades looking for molecules that flip the same metabolic switches as exercise, something that ramps up fat oxidation, improves mitochondrial function, and enhances endurance, even if you're sitting on the couch. And we've seen plenty of false starts. So you may remember cartering, which did improve endurance in rodents but then got pulled because of tumor concerns or ACAR, which looked promising in animals but had poor efficacy and an unappealing side effect profile in humans. So why is SLUB different? And why has it become the new darling of both exercise researchers and, let's be honest, the bodybuilding and biohacker forums? It comes down to what it targets, the estrogen-related receptors, and how cleanly it seems to activate the endurance pathways without some of the messier side effects we've seen before. So at the cellular level, exercise is essentially a mitochondrial stress test. When you move, your muscle cells sense the increased energy demand and start signaling to ramp up mitochondria, the little power plants in your cells, and to build more capillaries to deliver oxygen and nutrients. The master controller of this response is a co-activator called PGC1-alpha. Sloop effectively bypasses some of the upstream signals and directly activates the nuclear receptors that work alongside PGC1-alpha, specifically the ERRs, or estrogen-related receptors. So what happens then? In the most cited mouse studies, SLUP increased treadmill endurance by about 70%. Mice that normally tired after 50 minutes could suddenly go almost 90. Muscle biopsies from these animals showed more mitochondria, bigger mitochondria, and even structural changes. The cristae, or the inner folds where ATP are generated, became more densely packed. Blood vessel density increased also, meaning more oxygen delivery. And these changes didn't take months. Within 48 hours, gene expression shifted dramatically toward a fat oxidation, slow twitch muscle phenotype. Over the course of two weeks, the muscles began to resemble those of trained endurance athletes. It's also worth noting, and this detail doesn't get enough attention, that this shift towards type 1 and type 2A fibers comes at a trade-off. As fast-switch type 2B fibers shrink, explosive power may decrease slightly. So if you're a sprinter or powerlifter, this isn't necessarily the adaptation you're chasing. And it's not just muscle. In rodent models, SLUP improved liver fat content and insulin sensitivity. It reduced fibrosis in failing hearts, and it even showed protective effects in aging kidneys by cutting oxidative stress markers in half. So the biology is compelling, no questions about that. But here's where the hype runs into the reality. In all of these studies, SLUP was delivered by injection. That's not a detail you can just gloss over. And why? Because when researchers tried giving it orally, they found it has very poor bioavailability, meaning the molecule doesn't survive the acidic environment in the stomach. It gets chewed up by the enzymes, and what little does make it through is quickly cleared by the liver. In simple terms, the vast majority of what you swallow never reaches your muscles in an active form. In pharmacology, we call this the first pass effect, and SLUP is a textbook victim of it. In fact, researchers measured plasma levels in mice and found that oral dosing barely moved the needle, whereas subcutaneous or intraperitoneal injection achieved the necessary concentration for ER activation. Although there is some work being done to solve this, Medicinal chemists are experimenting with adding fluorine atoms to shield the molecule, developing prodrugs that can sneak past the gut, or encapsulating it in nanoparticles for better absorption. But none of these have made it to humans yet. So until someone develops a version that survives the digestive tract, the online capsules aren't delivering the results you think they are. Now let's talk about what the forums tend to miss. One underappreciated risk is that ERRs aren't exclusive to muscle tissue. They're expressed in heart, liver, kidney, even some cancerous tissues and we still don't fully understand what long-term activation might do in humans. In rodent cancer models, ERR activation hasn't shown a clear signal of harm yet, but those studies were short, and tumors don't typically emerge in a six-week study, so we can't declare it safe until we have long-term human data. 
Another overlooked point is detection. Because Sloop works by changing gene expression rather than boosting red blood cell counts like EPO, it's much harder to detect in anti-doping tests. But that doesn't mean it's invisible forever. Labs are already working on metabolic signatures, subtle changes in fatty acid metabolites that can signal ERR activation. So if you're thinking about skirting the rules with this, don't assume you'll stay under the radar. And finally, and this is a subtle but important point, Sloop seems to be more effective in metabolically compromised animals. In obese or sedentary mice, the effects were dramatic. In already fit animals, the improvement was still significant, but smaller. So if you already have well-trained mitochondria, you may not get the earth-shattering gains you expect. So if Sloop were gonna become a legitimate drug, here's roughly what needs to happen. First formulation, chemists must develop a version that can be taken orally with at least 30% bioavailability in a reasonable half-life. No one's there yet. Phase one is the next step. Healthy volunteers get small doses to test safety, metabolism, and dosing. This is where we learn about tolerability and pharmacokinetics in humans. The next step is phase two. Target populations, like heart failure or sarcopenia patients, take the drug for weeks or months to measure efficacy. Step four, that's phase three. Larger, longer trials to catch rare side effects, evaluate real-world benefit, and satisfy regulators. And lastly, approval and cost. If all goes perfectly, which is rare, you're looking at somewhere between $500 and $1,000 per month, at least for the first few years. Meanwhile, the gray market powders and capsules will still circulate, but with unknown purity, unknown dosing, and no guarantee you're getting anything active. And there are legitimate, exciting possibilities here, if Sloop delivers on its promise. For example, people with advanced heart failure who can't tolerate enough exercise to improve their condition. Additionally, patients with severe obesity or mobility limitations who simply can't move enough to shift from metabolism. Also, astronauts on long-duration missions where muscle atrophy is a constant threat. And lastly, seniors losing muscle due to frailty or arthritis. On the other hand, it's likely to be abused by athletes trying to shave seconds off race times or by weekend warriors looking for shortcuts. And ironically, those folks already have decent mitochondrial function and stand to gain the least while taking on all the risk. So here are a few science-based facts that you might find interesting. First, in the key rodent study, mitochondrial DNA and muscle doubled in just seven days a change that normally takes months or more of training. Secondly, resting energy expenditure in obese mice increased by about 15%, roughly equivalent to an extra 300 calories burned per day. Next, in failing hearts, the levels of BNP, a marker of cardiac stress, dropped 40% with sloop treatment. Additionally, capillary density in muscle increased enough that oxygen delivery became visibly improved under microscope, something even elite athletes struggle to achieve naturally. And lastly, the molecule's chemical scaffold was actually discovered in an old pesticide library, a reminder that useful tools can come from unexpected places. So where does all this leave us? Here are the big points I want you to walk away with. Number one, exercise still wins. Even if Sloop delivers part of the benefit, it doesn't replace the hormonal, neurological, and physiological effects of real movement. Number two, oral forms today are almost certainly worthless. If you're buying capsules online, you're likely wasting your money, the molecule isn't orally available yet. And third, long-term safety is unknown. Tumors, fibrosis, off-target effects, these don't show up overnight. Be cautious. Number four, the potential is real. For the right populations, the frail, immobile, chronically ill, this could be a game changer. And lastly, be skeptical but curious. Follow the science, not the marketing hype. So if you're intrigued by Sloop, that's awesome. You should be. But right now it's a research tool, not a therapy. Keep your expectations realistic. Keep moving your body the old-fashioned way and watch the data as it comes in. And lastly, if you found this helpful, please go ahead and hit that like button. And if you want updates when the first human trials start reporting results, make sure you subscribe because those early data could drop any month now. And as always, I thank you for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks.